I do not care to trace the course of my dollar, if I could, till it buys a man or a musket to shoot one with. The dollar is innocent, but I am concerned to trace the effects of my allegiance. In fact, I quietly declare war with the state after my fashion, though I will still make what use and get what advantage of her I can, as is usual in such cases. Well, this is obviously powerful language. Notice that line again. He says, I quietly declare war with the state. This is fundamental to what it means to be an American and a citizen to, this is one of the reasons we read an essay like this, to remind ourselves that when you're a great American, you challenge the state. And yet, you still have to find a way to live within the state. This is the point. That is to say, a certain kind of political balance or harmony is obviously in play. Okay, let's finish the essay then, uh, paragraphs 38 through 45. Unlike natural forces, he says, a government of men warrants resistance. Those who pay much attention to the government, however, or work within it, are paying homage to a static manifestation of human values rather than to those values themselves. The ideal government would be just to all men and would treat every individual with respect. I love the final, uh, the final paragraph of this essay. Let's just go ahead and take a look at it. This is paragraph 45. The authority of government, even such as I am willing to submit to, for I will cheerfully obey those who know and can do better than I, and in many things even those who neither know nor can do so well. Notice he's not an outright anarchist at all. And people who read Thoreau as that are, of course, misreading this essay. He says, though, it is still an impure one, this form of government. To be strictly just, we're in justice, are we not? It must have the sanction and consent of the governed. Jefferson said as much in the DOI, didn't he? It can have no pure right over my person and property, but what I can see to it. Rousseau said as much in social contract. The progress from an absolute to a limited monarchy, from a limited monarchy to democracy, to a, is a progress towards a true respect for the individual. Even the Chinese philosopher was wise enough to regard the individual as the basis of the empire. And of course here he's talking Confucius, although we could obviously think a little bit about Lao Tzu in our study of, of Lao Tzu, right? And then he asks an interesting rhetorical question. Is a democracy such as we know it the last improvement possible in government? Is it not possible to take, to take a step further towards recognizing and organizing the rights of man? There will never be a really free and enlightened state until the state comes to recognize the individual as a higher and independent power from which all its own power and authority are derived and treats him accordingly. I please myself with imagining a state. Notice the use of the word imagining. This is the influence of Plato and Plato's Republic. As, uh, with imagining a state at last which can afford to be, to be just to all men and to treat the individual with respect as a neighbor, which even would not think it inconsistent with its own repose if a few were to live aloof from it, not meddling with it, not embracing, but not embraced by it, who fulfilled all the duties of neighbors and fellow men. A state which bore this kind of fruit and suffered it to drop off as fast as it is ripened would prepare the way for a still more perfect and glorious state, which also I have dreamed, I have imagined, but not yet anywhere seen. This notion of longing for a situation where we live within groups and yet the individual is properly respected. Well, obviously, it's the dream, it's the goal, but notice for Thoreau, it's worth fighting for, and in some way, contesting for, you might say. Well, let's finish at level two, eh? Uh, what, our big five. What does this text say about epistemology? Well, notice, this is powerful stuff, because Thoreau seems to be taking an absolutist position until you look more closely at it. And notice he says, when men are prepared for this kind of government, that is to say he takes the fallibilist position as we've often spoken about it. I think I'm right, I could be wrong. Notice his argument seems to be primarily a fallibilist argument. Although there are some things he is absolutely certain of, no time in history has it ever been right for there to be slavery. Frederick Douglass would obviously agree. Ontologically, what do we know about who we are? This text says we are free individuals and we have to remain that way. Of course, as Frederick Douglass will say, there's a lot of forms of slavery and one of those 
the most horrific, is that intellectual slavery. Notice for Thoreau, he feels the same way. To not pay attention to what your government does is to be a slave to your government, and you shouldn't be a slave to anything. Freedom, the freedom and the prizing of freedom is huge. Psychologically, what does this text say? Notice the importance of defiance here. Overcoming fear with courage, even if you're alone. You're, uh, you, you're still a, ma a majority of one, as he will say. Uh, sociologically, what does this text suggest? Well, it asks, can we have a group of individuals? It's a very interesting question, right? That is to say, what is a democracy uh, if it's not a group of individuals who then can discuss, discord? This is why free speech is so important in any discussions. This is why education is so important, to learn how to speak well one's mind and hear what others have to say, right? Mindless obedience, obviously, sociologically speaking, therefore, is dangerous. No question about it. Finally, what does this text say about theodicy and when bad things happen? And I think that this is the central tenet here. When bad things happen, stop asking, why did it happen to me? Learn to ask, why did it happen for me? Notice, he gets thrown in jail, and what does he do for a night? He turns around and he uses the experience to somehow make the world a better place. Martin Luther King Jr. will do the exact same thing as will Gandhi, and we think, of course, of St. Paul writing those epistles in the New Testament from jail. This is one of those really foundational arguments that when you are in a tough spot, find something to, to use it for your benefit, for your growth. Since we're there, let's talk messages. Well, the force of the, right, the dedicated individual can bring about huge change. One drop of water can produce the waterfall. Those of you who know the film Power of One comes to mind immediately. Courage and sustained will, another major message brings about change. Notice it's got to be sustained will. You've got to be willing to hold to an idea and stick to that idea until, of course, somebody has given you a reason to depart from it. And then finally, and I think this is sometimes missing, um, I just want to go back to the opening lines of, um, of this essay again. And some people will make, obviously, they, they don't pay that much attention to this little, this little phrase. He says, that government is best which governs not at all, and when men are prepared for it, that will be the kind of government which they will have. And I think that when men are prepared for it is a huge message and one we need to put in our notes. The power of education, the importance of education. Why are we here, Mr. McGillian? What's the point of all of this thing called our schooling? One answer, of course, is so that you can learn what it means to be a citizen. Because as I said to you, you're not born an American. You're not born a patriot. You choose these things, and you need to be conscious of how you're choosing and why you're choosing these things. And in that moment, you become the American, you become the patriot, you become the citizen that contributes to the well-being of the greater good by challenging at times that very organization, that very government itself. That's what justice is, according to Thoreau. And to be, well, the, rhetor the rhetoric here, notice the memorable lines Right, and as well that notice that crisscross relationship, that chastisement as we were speaking of it. Um, it's so brilliant to, to see how that's pointed out. Notice as well that defiant tone, that don't tell me uh, what to do tone, which of course is so foundational to being an American, which is why I think this essay continues to be so loved. Well, at 3A, we've mentioned so many titles already. Obviously, Plato's Republic comes to mind. Think about the titles we've already read, Machiavelli's Prince, the Tao Te Ching, Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, and ask, how, would, how, how does this essay work with all of those thinkers? Douglas, obviously, we've already mentioned. Uh, Booker T. Washington, I mentioned in the last lecture, Up From Slavery, it's an important, I think it's an important analog read to what's going on here. We mentioned Emily Dickinson and her poetry, but I want to throw another name out. Maya Angelou and, and, and her classic autobiography, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, who li lived out in her life this very notion. She loved her country, but she was constantly challenging her country. You can do both. And I think Thoreau wants to remind us of that. Finally, at 3B, how do we relate this information to ourselves? What was a time when you were a majority of one? You had to stand up. And, that, and, and there wasn't anybody else that was going to stand with you. And you knew it was the right thing to do, so you stood up. What was the time when you did that? What was the time when you wish you had done that? Ooh. That's an important question to ask, right? What do you need, well, another question, what do you need, uh, believe, what do you believe needs to be fought against? Right? What are those struggles? 
And are you willing to engage in that struggle in a, in a respectful way? I think that's important. This is a very respectful essay. Make no bones about it. This essay will seek to affirm a position through language. To what degree do you feel like there are some things which need to be challenged? What about this importance of courage? How does that relate to you? Sustained will and courage. To discover justice. In what ways are you doing that? Now in your life and in your future life. Well, speaking of sustained will and speaking of courage, the, arguably the greatest of our American heroes in many ways. Like a great epic hero, like a great biblical hero, Martin Luther King Jr. It's interesting that his name is in fact Luther mentioned, of course, in this, in this essay. That notion of challenging is going to be brilliantly articulated by another individual who spent some time in jail. Let's talk about Martin Luther King Jr. next in his classic uh, essay uh, from a Birmingham jail. I hope that this information is helping you to become more a patriot. Thank you.